Welcome to Embedded. I am Alicia White alongside Christopher White. This week we're going to talk about many things. Physics, art, quantum computing, teaching, fashion. So I guess we have like six guests on? Oh, actually, given that list, we could really only have Kitty Young as our guest. Hi, Kitty. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Could you tell us about yourself? I am Kitty. I work as a senior program manager and creative technologist at Microsoft. I currently work on quantum computing, um, and I produce education materials for quantum computing. And I am a physicist, but I love art. So I have a fashion brand called Art by Physicist, which I design uh, dresses and wearable technologies for. I'm hoping we get to talk about all of that, but I also am hoping we don't end up with a three-hour long show. So before we get started, oh, we want to do lightning round where we ask you short questions. We want short answers, and if we're behaving ourselves, we we'll, won't say, are you sure, and how, and why, and where can I get one? Mm-hmm. Christopher, will you go first? Sure. The Copenhagen interpretation, fact or fiction? Neither is the interpretation. <laughs> she does work in quantum mechanics. <laughs> Would you rather complete one project or start a dozen? Complete one project. Uh, there's two options for this question. I will ask you it the, the one way, and then if you don't like it, I'll, I'll ask a stif- different meta question. How many electrons are in a chicken? I don't know. That's, uh, that's the short answer. Is that a fair question to ask a master's candidate? Master's in physics. Yes, yes, yes. Define fair. <laughs> Uh, right. You need to give them additional information for them to calculate. Great. Thank you. Thank you. I like the much, weight of the chicken? I feel much better now. <laughs> Density. <laughs> Assuming it's mostly water. You know? Yeah. Uh, do you have a favorite acronym? No, I don't like acronyms. Uh, do giraffes make sense? Yeah, totally. Do you have a favorite fictional robot? I like Marvin from the 2005 version of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And do you have a tip everyone should know? I would recommend everyone teach their kids automation. Why automation? Um, It's going to be very useful if they have a hobby they want to do. They can have their some of the labors done with machines and they can do more creative work. Okay, so professionally, your primary method of earning money, what do you do? Uh, I work at Microsoft as a physicist and a program manager. And that's my day job. And I I love that too, because it allows me to stay as a technical physicist. Um, Okay, so... At Microsoft Physicist, you work in quantum computing. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Um, It means different for different people working in the group. Uh, So I manage the education effort for uh, the quantum computing uh, content. Uh, So I manage the documentation and create the MS Learn education materials and also I teach. I teach the community, um, sometimes give workshops. Uh, so for different people, we have a lot of different roles in quantum computing. So there are researchers, there are also programmers, there are a lot of uh, program managers that need to help create products. So uh, my role is quite unique and fun to produce materials that we need to communicate to people because this is relatively still a emerging technology and emerging industry. We need to give people the learning that they need in order to solve their problems using quantum computing or learn the materials in order to become the next generation of quantum computing workforce. What would I do with the quantum computer? other than crack passwords. 
<laughs> yeah, Schwartz algorithm is definitely one of the interesting ones that has a application. <laughs> so it's maybe a negative application because uh, using Schwartz algorithm, you can very quickly break, as you said, the RSA encryption method. But that also means that we need to come up with better algorithms to have more secure encryption methods. And other than that, there are a lot of problems that our current classical computers are not able to solve. Uh, even some problems our most powerful supercomputers can run into limitations. So things like simulation for chemical materials, discovery, drugs, uh, those are relying on fundamental quantum mechanical interactions. So our maybe the, the best computers still struggle when we try to simulate and run uh, simulations to understand materials and coming up with designs of these materials. There are also some problems that are not fundamentally classical. They are, uh, sorry, they're not fundamentally quantum. They're classical problems, but we run into every day like optimization and uh, cryptography you already mentioned, and data processing, that we could leverage the different way that quantum computer offers to solve this problem using a quantum-inspired or uh, quantum mechanical method to represent those problems and solve them more efficiently. The sorts of problems we're talking about, are these the ones that in CS are called NP-hard or P-space complete? Yeah, there are, there are quite a lot of them in that. I mean, can quantum actually solve that level of problem? Um, the, there's ongoing research. And the, it, this is definitely a developing field that a lot of researchers are trying to come up with new algorithms to solve these classically unsolvable problems. Okay, so I come to you with a problem. Like, uh, there are some origami folding methods that are <laughs> determining whether or not they're <laughs> foldable is hmm. is an, uh, definitely harder than NP-complete, maybe, maybe P-space complete. So how how do I... What do I do? I mean, quantum computing has always been this thing that's like... Maybe we should back up and talk you, about what quantum <laughs> computing is. Computing is. Well, I mean, it's obviously mm. computing with quanta. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually... Because it's, it's completely different from, from normal, uh, normal computing methods. Yeah, like normal computing, classical computing, we rely on bits. That's like using uh, transistors on and off. But in quantum computing, you can leverage this superposition of different states. So it's not just zero or one. You can have zero and one in superposition or linear combination. So you have a probability of having zero and a probability of having one in your qubit system. So in this way, you can actually uh, have two effects coming out uh, due to superposition you can have interference of amplitudes between these different states. And you can also have entanglements between qubits. So entanglement means that when you put them into a uh, specially arranged configuration, you can measure one of the qubits without measuring the other one. You already know the result of the other one. Their, their results are correlated. So that you can imagine could be very useful in quantum communication. And um, interference allows you to uh, extract this powerfulness of the uh, quantum computing uh, that you can let more likely result to come out and uh, the less likely results will be canceling each other out. Um, so you can get these interference between amplitudes. So quantum computing is a clever way for you to leverage these three concepts. You can write algorithms to let your uh, qubits represent the data. And you can encode uh, whatever number or 
uh, text into your qubit and then feed that into some uh, algorithm that allows you to do this interference and entanglement. And very efficiently at the end, you can get the type of data that you desire. It's not going to be faster. It's not going to be like, I think a lot of confusion around parallel computing is not going to be uh, always faster than all of the existing classical algorithms. But for certain problems, you can leverage superposition, entanglement, um, and interference to take advantage of. Okay, I'm going to go back to origami because it's something that I understand. <laughs> when you start out... I don't understand art. <laughs> Okay, when you start out with a piece of paper, you can get a crease pattern from various places. Mm -hmm. And it's it's a there are mountain and valley folds. And that is part of the crease pattern usually. But there's this idea that you can have a whole bunch of lines on the paper that should represent mountain and valley folds, but you don't know. You don't know which which it is. Is it is it up or down? And then the question becomes is this a foldable pattern? How, what does it fold into if you don't know which are up and down? What are the possible folds? And so it sounds like the what you're talking about with the probability, if I, if I set all of the folds to 50% uh, up, 50% down, and then I entangle some of the points so that if two points are on an edge, they have to go up or down themselves. Is this, am I, am I thinking about this right? I know, I know this is putting it in a different frame, but. That's a very interesting question. Yeah. I think there might be two ways to think about this. Uh, I'm not an expert in origami. Uh, Me neither, really. I guess it would depend on uh, the type of problem you want to solve with your fold. Um, I, so kind of representing your troughs and valleys with your uh, with amplitudes. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think this problem is a quantum mechanical problem, but you can, if you want to play with uh, interference, perhaps uh, you can represent it in a way. But the other thing that I th can think of that quantum can perhaps help is not strictly quantum computing using uh, interference and entanglement is more like learning from quantum mechanical reactions and then represent your system with a Hamiltonian that, that can allow you to find the minimum energy state. This I know that has been applied to origami, that how do you fold a piece of paper into a certain shape? How much energy will that take? And what is the minimum energy number of folds or uh, whatever configuration that your system is the most comfortable and most likely to be in, perhaps this could be a question you can represent it with a quantum-inspired op uh, op optimization problem. So perhaps you can write the Hamiltonian of your uh, system and solve it as a matrix to uh, do a minimal energy, like a eigen energy, eigenvalue type of calculation that could be something interesting to explore I, yes although setting up the hamiltonian is actually the hard part here yeah sure because <laughs> there's there are too it many is, options yeah. it's it, it's it's you know if you have one fold on a paper it's either a mountain or a valley if you have two and they cross now you can do some interesting things and if you have a hundred it just gets impossible I want to interject and just say that this conversation makes me so happy. Yeah, I think we've won <laughs> quantum bingo already with Hamiltonian. Just, you know, it's been 344 episodes and finally somebody's mentioned Hamiltonian. I was, I was wondering if I should mention it. <laughs> okay, Yeah. one of you explain what a Hamiltonian is. I'll, I'll, I'll let the, the person with the PhD do it. <laughs> um, I would just explain it in a pretty high level that is a way for you to capture the behavior and state of your system is basically it has the unit of energy. So say, for example, some 
a thought experiment. If you want to roll down a ball from a mountain down to the valley, is converting from a high potential energy state to a high kinetic energy state as it rolls down and speeds up. And both the kinetic energy and potential energy can be captured in your Hamiltonian as two as two terms. And in quantum mechanics, you need to work out the uh, energy of your, um, say, a hydrogen molecule. You write it into a Schrodinger's equation, and it tells you how your system behaves. And the Schrodinger equation's solution will include the energy, the potential energy, or kinetic energy, or some other terms uh, in your system, and also the wave function that that can describe how your quantum mechanical state behaves. Okay, I have more origami questions, but <laughs> <laughs> I need to. I should have googled more about it. No, I didn't even put it in the outlet. I mean, the reason it's interesting from. A quantum perspective is some of the problems that come up with paper are way more complex when you apply them to proteins. And protein folding is really interesting, but it's also unbelievably difficult to predict. So, can you give us an example of a like the simplest? What's the hello world of quantum computing? <laughs> <laughs> Depending on the type of problem you want to solve. So, if it is a hello world to test if your system is in a quantum state, you could use like a teleportation demonstration. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the hello world of quantum computing is a teleportation demonstration. That is the best. <laughs> so if you can show your system, if you had two qubits, you, and if you can show that they can teleport, and that, that means you can entangle them, and that also means you can uh, you have put it in a quantum state, uh, but there there are things that are much simpler. So uh, we have the Q sharp language that we can use to. Of prevent. course, I was going to ask, yeah. and I was going to make a joke that it was going to be Q sharp, and it was. <laughs> yeah, like you you don't have to get into the hardware and the internal working of a qubit to do quantum programming. So we have this whole set of. Uh, libraries and uh, everything that you need as a new language for computation, we have one design for a quantum computer. We can use q -sharp to program any type of quantum computers. And you can just simply write some code and say hello world. And perhaps you can write like a simple uh, entanglement or superposition code to, to demonstrate. So that's probably kind of a hello world for it. Okay. Is Q-sharp something somebody can play with without a quantum computer? I mean, can it be simulated? Yeah. And all that you can find on Microsoft's documentation, quantum documentation. Uh, just search Microsoft quantum documentation, and there's the whole list of Q-sharp documentation. And it has the simulation, and we also have the cloud computing service uh, the actual quantum service that allows people to write code on your own computer, but then connect to a quantum computer through the cloud and then program it that way. He is so excited right now. I <laughs> cannot tell you. Yes, you should jump on it and try it. We have a lot of uh, free learning materials, GitHub, open source. You can, you can even write anything right now and contribute to the GitHub uh, repositories. Okay, I want to talk about that. But first, I want to talk about the quantum computer itself. I mean, mm -hmm. mentally, I, I remember having uh, wet uh, chemical computers described to me long ago where you put a problem into like a protein and then you shake it around and it turns colors to answer your question. And I remember there were DNA-based computers yes. too. That, that was a it, particular that... strand of DNA and it would solve a problem. Yeah, so my mental model of quantum computers involves shoving electrons in places and shaking them, which I don't think is right. What does the hardware look like? How do you build a quantum computer? There are different types. There are different kinds of architecture. Uh, the commonly built ones that's pursued by 
industry and some、uh, academics, there's the superconducting circuits, which is like CMOS fabricated using conductors and inductors, and you can create a resonance in your circuit, and that you can use to represent your、uh, qubit states in a superposition, and you can entangle them. Uh, we also have trapped irons, which are using iron that have spins. You can define certain spin to be,、uh, or certain spin energy to be your zero state, and another one to be one state. And you can manipulate that to go up and down, and you can put them into superposition. So basically, you need a two-level system that you can control and、uh, make. Because they're already quantum mechanical systems, their energy levels are already in superposition, and then you need a way to、uh, manipulate which state they are on.、Uh, Microsoft is building this topological type of quantum computing, so it's a stack of materials that、uh, got like superconductors, semiconductors, insulators stacked together, and you can create this. Uh, special states for electrons to occupy, and they at certain places on the nanowire you can create those states, and when they're occupied, your system, your qubit can be in the zero、uh, or one state. If they're empty, it could be zero state. So it's using many many electrons interaction between each other, and extracting this topological behavior. Of your system to represent your zero set ones. So there are different types, and there are pros and cons between all of them. So the industry is definitely working very hard to build more and more scalable ones to、uh, use them for different applications. Scalable. That that's the、yeah. word. So those all sound like things you build individually, not not like. Transistors, which you just buy a chip full of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because transistors have been very, very mature. Yes, yes. In decades, yeah. <laughs> how many? How many of these are in a computer? How many of these? So, if I assume it's going to、uh, quantum computing is kind of like Azure that you log in and you get some time on a quantum computer. Yeah, that's right. So how many? How many qubits? How many qubits? That's right. How many qubits can I have? Ah,、uh, it depends on the the companies too. I think those numbers we can probably find online is not that important actually.、Uh, how many qubits can you have? Okay, is more about、uh, if you can scale them and build. Certain tasks to solve them,、uh, cer- certain problems that you can use them to solve,、um, and if they can be entangled, because you could have like a lot of qubits, but none of them is entangled, so that's useless.、Um, there's also error correction you have to take into account. So the actual qubits、uh, number of qubits that you need for a algorithm is. Smaller, much smaller than the actual numbers that you will need to take into account error corrections.、Oh. Stupid so probability. Are, <laughs> so, yeah, so you you want to have a robust hardware system so that you can minimize the the actual qubits that you need, but it's very difficult. So, as part of setting up a, a quantum computing problem, I'm I'm designing the algorithm. I'm inputting it into the computer, very, very difficultly <laughs> <laughs> through Q Sharp, which I'm sure is easy.、Um, and then I run it, and the results are kind of instantaneous, right? Right. Either you get the answer, or a demon appears and eats you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always worried about that. <laughs> well, any computation takes time. Okay, so that that is a myth in my head. Then that that quantum computing, because it works instantaneously, it, that it no because、yeah. it's all probabilities. It 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 should just. I mean, they should entangle. They should interfere, and then I should get the answer. 
I mean, how long can that possibly take? <laughs> Well, you have to put them into the actual hardware, and also you need to compare what algorithms you're doing. Uh, I can give you a scale, like the Groover's search algorithm, which is a algorithm used that's using entanglement and interference, and is trying to find items that you're looking for that uh, in a in a on ordered list. So. It, I like to give people this metaphor is like you're looking for a book in the library. You know the title, but this library is very disorganized. Everything is so uh, just not ordered at all. So if you are using a classical algorithm, then you have to kind of look at each item one by one. If you are lucky, the first one is what you're looking for. But if you're unlucky, maybe the last one is what you're looking for. So um, then if you have N books, then you have to look uh, at it like N times. If you are using Groover's algorithm, which is letting you feed all of your books into your uh, entanglement and in, uh, interference box, then the books that you're not looking for are kind of canceling each other out. And when you output, one that you're looking for has a really sharp peak and you, you can identify the item. And that could be much faster. You don't have to look at every single um, book one by one. So the classical algorithm scales with two to the N if you have N bits, but the Groover's algorithm has a scale of two to the N over two if you have N qubits. So it's better. Uh, if you have a very large n, then you yeah. will see Groover's yeah. will have a much. Oh, the exponent uh, is n over two. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So you don't know the absolute factor if you run the algorithm once, how long it will take. But you can see that if n is big enough, then Groover's will be advantageous. Gotcha. So it's like a competition between the fastest supercomputer and the fastest quantum computer. Okay, I think we're reaching the point where I want a whiteboard and 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 to understand better. But you've already done that. You you've been teaching that both for Microsoft and for Hackaday. Mm -hmm. um, you, how does that work? Is it yeah? How does that work? <laughs> yeah, I've been teaching on Sundays at Hackaday U uh, since April. I started teaching this. It was just. Quite spontaneous is uh, I wanted to draw a lot of the understandings I had about what I love to do and quantum computing is uh, what I wanted to represent with comics. And then Hackaday started this ask for content that during the uh, pandemic, we wanted to offer the community some new learning then uh, quantum computing is a great topic for that. So I actually started teaching people during the whole lockdown. Um, and it's been, I guess, tomorrow will be the 20th session <laughs> that I, I will teach. Um, and then Microsoft is, uh, Microsoft Reactor is also promoting the event. So it became like a co-host thing for Hackaday and Microsoft Reactor. Uh, we got a lot of community from different channels that's joining the class every Sunday. And it's recorded, so people yes. can catch up and then exactly. join the class live. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, we are teaching through Teams. Uh, I draw a, a piece of comic every week. So when before people join the class, they can see the comics. They know what topics we're going to talk about and all of the Slides are saved and uploaded on Hackaday.io. I have a project called Quantum Computing Through Comics, and people can find all of the recording links there too. And the Hackaday folks wanted me to mention that they're currently hiring teachers for all topics related to engineering, hard science, and math. People can email superconference at hackaday.io. Um, so you'll be getting more compatriots. Great. And you, you've mentioned the comic. 
What made you decide to do a comic book style instead of Visio or other more traditional methods? Uh, I think comic is quite traditional. I, I hand drew everything. Um, it's just an art form that I'm very comfortable with and I love doing. I've been I've been drawing as long as I can remember. So I, I was uh, a kid. I started drawing and I've always been using comics and graphic novel style to convey ideas. So this became a natural choice of a media for me. So I also wanted to present quantum computing not in a very heavy way because to some people it could sound a bit intimidating. (laughs) I think there's a lot of myth and hype about it that is not necessary. The actually quantum computing is not that hard. We just have to explain it clearly and not in an intimidating way. Um, so the comics actually played a pretty important role in drawing people's interests and kind of people stop thinking that's a really hard thing that they can't do anymore. So I'm very happy about the effect. Making it approachable is very important. Mm-hmm. Yes. Your your comics often have a cat in them. Is, yeah. is the cat named Schrodinger? Or does the cat have a different name? Oh, good question. So you they're can't actually know. different characters. <laughs> the name, yes. Um, well, that is from Schrodinger's original joke that uh, I think he actually came up with the metaphor to mock quantum ideas. Uh, that if you put a cat in a box, the the key here is that uh, in the box you have a radioactive mechanism that is itself quantum and that can trigger a poison to be spilled or not. So if the cat drinks the poison, it will be dead. If the cat doesn't, then it will be alive. But you would never know until you open the box and see what the result is. But the key here is that it it is triggered by a quantum mechanical reaction. It's not just any any cat in a box. Right. So, <laughs> no, um, in, just putting a cat in a box is not a good way. <laughs> um, in my comics, um, so I like cats uh, a lot. <laughs> and uh, the comics actually has many characters. I recently made a page that tells people their names. And they can actually use it as a game that they, they can look at the name and what they do. So I have like personas. I have a researcher who comes up with algorithms. I have programmers who come up with uh, applications and write problem into a quantum computing solution. Um, and there are early adopters, there are learners. They all have different names. So people can use that page to identify who they are and in which class they appear. I want to encourage people to do this and then they can watch that whole exercise, whole class, and then write down what they learn in a way, drive people to really understand the class. So if anyone sends me their thinking, I can even give them like a certificate. It's called an out of the box thinker certificate. (laughs) I like that. (laughs) We've got Alice and Bob and a referee. Okay, I shouldn't be reading this now. I, sh- I should be paying attention. <laughs> uh, the the comic style really does make it quite approachable. Um, quantum has been something that's quite intimidating. I mean, you say the word quantum and like... It's so cool, though. Sorry. <laughs> it, it just is scary. Cool and scary, but... You know, spooky action at a distance. This isn't real. I'm not doing this. Yeah, but those parts are all, all, a lot of those go into interpretation of what this all means, whereas the actual mechanics of doing quantum, that that's the part I like. All the other stuff is, you know, that's for cosmologists to figure out. I Yeah, I think is probably our, we physicists have, didn't do a good job explaining a lot of things. And, um, uh, we should make it more accessible, but not, not hype it, not um, make it sound 
so mysterious that if you don't have a PhD in something sciencey, you can't learn it. But the truth is, if you are passionate and curious about it, and you focus on the concepts,、uh, you can very quickly get started using a quantum computer. So I think, yeah, we need to do a better job、uh, demystifying it.、Uh, so this this seems like you know you you teach and you teach for Microsoft. You're doing teaching for Hackaday, and you do physics.、Um, But that's like, like okay. So that's your day job. At night, you put on a superhero costume and and do other things. <laughs> yeah, at night, I think I'm on a on a opposite shift now. That、uh, <laughs> at night, I need to work with my colleagues in the US. Right.、Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, but in my spare time, if I can find it, I、uh, do some creative work, like design, fashion, and. Paint, do some other graphic novel drawings, and I also do music. I play the piano and the harp, and I also sing. What planet are you from? Tell us. <laughs> I'm from the moon, not the planet. <laughs> <laughs> um. Okay. So, music, classical. I mean, harp and piano is usually classical.、Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, the, yeah, I love jazz as well, but I am classically trained. So most of the pieces I play are from the classical and romantic eras. Ah,、uh, but the the fashion part. When did your art turn to fashion? That was a few years ago, I guess. When I was finishing my PhD, I. Finished all the hands-on experimental parts, and I was just writing my thesis then. And I really wanted to make something by hand and learn some new skills. I decided to buy a sewing machine and some book and learn some classes from YouTube and started sewing.、Uh, even my first piece was a design that I drew on the paper. I've always been designing. Uh, for my graphic novel characters, especially, so I wanted to turn those ideas into reality. I also paint a lot of like nature scenes, astronomical scenes. I have a, a set of digital paintings that I have on my website. So I started looking at places where I can print them into very large fabrics. Then I started making dresses that have my paintings on them. They are really large pieces that, like a whole dress, is showing the Earth or、uh, showing Saturn, the planet. And and on the side, I was playing with these open source hardware. Did some robotics projects with friends. So I thought, why can't I combine the two? I can I can put the electronics into clothes, and why not? So that's when I started merging different areas, and so now you have dresses that light up.、Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was fun. It was quite natural when when you're a maker, you do things by hand, and you can put something very quickly together when you have an idea. But the hard part was actually turning those ideas, prototypes, into products, and that's really triggered my curiosity. When people ask me where to buy my designs. I really didn't know how how that whole design to manufacturing process worked. Then I started looking into manufacturing, and there were a lot of problems and、uh, crazy problems in the fashion industry.、Uh, so turning my original handmade thing into a product took quite a while. What kind of problems? I mean, I, thinking about moving something from a maker to a, a production system that's <laughs> I believe、yeah. Alan wrote a book about that,、um, but how is it different for fashion and and manufacturing, or or how is it the same? Yeah, fashion industry is very very old.、Uh, we've been making clothes for thousands of years, and we have been making clothes pretty much the same way in the past hundred to two hundred years after the first industrial revolution, when It helped the industry do things mass scale, mass production of repeated units. 
So if you're a new designer coming into this space, it's very difficult to find manufacturers who can support small scale that can allow you to test the market first to build your maybe crazy handmade, interesting designs into products. That was the first hurdle that I came across. And then I also found out that how pollutive that whole mass production method is because the manufacturing is forcing everyone to mass produce. You basically have to have a really large quantity in order to build a brand. But then brands never know how much they can sell anything. There's not really any good prediction of the market. So they would try to guess how much something could sell, but they don't want to lose the the profit. Then they would overproduce. And it turned out that the clothes that's overproduced every year that's never sold is 30% globally. Wow. Yeah. And what do those brands do? They may donate it. They may sell them at lower prices. But we don't actually know how much they would send to landfill or each brand. We don't know how much they would uh, send to landfill or burn them. But we know that globally, 10% of carbon footprint comes from the fashion industry. So each brand would spend tens of billions of dollars making their new designs this season. And then they need to try very hard to get rid of them. So, yeah, it's quite sad to find out all of this. As an engineer, I think there are solutions. Uh, It's quite shocking, to be honest, that as an engineer coming to the fashion industry and seeing all these problems, you think that there are actually solutions, there are ways that we can solve them. We need to support creative designers to turn their ideas into reality. We also need to get rid of the waste and pollution. Yeah, I mean, we almost need a make on on demand so that you don't end up with extra stuff. Exactly. And we need to stop convincing people that they need to buy things just to buy them. Exactly. It has to go to this. We need to go back to made to order where... Before, before it was all mass produced, everyone had to go to a tailor and get something custom made for them, but it's very, very slow. And, and we, expensive. we still have that. Yeah, expensive. We, we still have that system. So only if you want for special occasions, you may wear something like that. But for everyday wear, we need to change this day, uh, this mass produced model. We have the technology now that in the 21st century, we have all these front-end, back-end technologies we need to connect together to not just predict the market, but also allowing consumers to directly tell designers and uh, fashion brands what they want. Then the manufacturer can just make them for the particular customer. And we have to build it in a scalable way that's able to reduce the cost because at the beginning if you're making one piece for one person it would be expensive but if you build a whole supply chain when it's mature it's not going to be that expensive and i know there are some vendors that do this now slowly slowly is um i think it has to be uh everyone has to do it everyone should use technology in their design and manufacturing process shorten the the development time so that they can allow creative designers turn their ideas into real products quickly. So actually, I would use 3D printing as an example. Like this is an industry that is very was very new and only took a few years to get to this mature stage. Now everyone can buy a 3D printer or they can send it to some service online. They can do design on a computer software then they can send any model online to get it produced and they can just pay for materials and shipping. Clothing needs to get to get there, like 3D printing. If designers can design everything digitally, that means we need to have a standard and we need to capture all of these materials, uh, trims, all the details that's in the tech pack digitally. 
then the designers can do everything on online and through the cloud. They can submit their designs and find the manufacturers that is closest to their consumers. So you can get things created more locally. This sounds like a huge problem. I mean, this sounds yeah. like there are so many. Yeah. Okay. No, take that, Kate. I think it. Yeah, it's not just uh, the technology. I was. I would say the technology is pretty much there. We just have to connect them, and a lot of our existing technologies that could help, like computer vision, three D simulation. They need to be applied in fashion industry. And they need to be connected to the physical manufacturing. So we need an infrastructure and network to do that. But the te technically, I think, is totally doable if one of the big um, places decides to completely do it, they can. And they need, but then it's also got a culture change, culture shift. We need to convince the traditional fashion industry to adopt the technology and also consumers to um, understand the problem and they they can drive the demand for this made to order. Is your fashion career going to become your day job? Definitely not completely fashion. It has to be fashion tech. Yeah. Without technology, I don't think fashion, fashion, yeah, is is there for a long time and I don't think I need to do pure fashion. But fashion tech has a lot of potential. Do you worry about being pigeonholed in social media or in real life as a fashion person and not a, quote, real engineer? Maybe the opposite. <laughs> 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 so perhaps I think in my earlier career, I might be pigeonholed as a scientist and someone who just do their research and do their experiments, but not creative enough. <laughs> but I, I want to do both. I want to use both my technical skills and creative skills. And I'm integrating the two through everything I do now. You have a shop uh, where you do sell your fashions and paintings. Uh, can you tell us the name of it? Yeah, is the brand is called Art by Physicist. The URL is shop.kittyyoung.com. So basically, if you just type Kitty Young, my name, .com, it would pop up. And of course, that will be in the show notes. Great. Uh, you have dresses that light up. You have some mm -hmm. dresses that don't. You have some dresses that are just, uh, you send fabric and uh, instructions. Mm -hmm. How do you decide whether something is a do-it-yourself dress or one that you create fully? Yeah, I am a proponent of open source. So I want to make fashion also part of the open source ecosystem. I want it to be as open as possible and modularize them. For creative people, they can get a piece of fabric with the patterns and the, the graphics already printed on the fabrics so they can cut and sew themselves. If it's a simple piece, I would do that and let creative people sew and do the... Uh, if, if they enjoy sewing, they, they can buy those fabrics. And for some more complicated ones, it is harder for people to do it uh, by hand. So I would develop them into a full product where people can purchase ready to wear. Uh, so I, yeah, I try to make them as modular and open source as possible. Uh, all of the clothes are my own paintings, my hand painted graphics. Uh, printed on the fabrics, and then I would overlay the patterns on them so they have the correct layout. So I'm really kind of uh, engineering clothing, like uh, you would design a piece of hardware, a uh, chip, say, and that's actually what I used to do was designing components on silicon photonic chips. So there is a lot of similarity to me. I treat a piece of fabric like 
in substrate, and then I lay things on top of it. I print my paintings, and then eventually, for some designs that make sense to add electronics, I would add, say, this starry night dress is a painting of the constellations. And it makes sense to add some LEDs so it lights up nicely and decorates it. I recently launched just a couple of days ago. Yeah. Launched this, yeah, this really new. Cool. Thanks. This new dress is inspired by astronomical images of Earth in space, where you can see sunrise and the moon going around Earth. Those beautiful NASA images you can you can easily find online. I'm always drawn into this beautiful space, starry nights, and nature. So I wanted to design a dress that represents that. So it has a piece of LED matrix panel inside the dress. This is a collaboration between my brand and Lumen Couture, which is my friend Chelsea Klukas's brand. We put this together uh, using the LEDs to allow you to actually draw and upload any videos, images, or GIFs. And then uh, I simulated this moon going around the Earth on the dress. You can see uh, city lights on the Earth area and also see sunrise gradually lighting up the Earth. So I think the, the effect is quite nice. So I'm very happy about this new release. And that one is a, a ready-to-wear, isn't it? Yes, this one is a ready-to-wear. And it has an LED panel. Mm-hmm. Um, does it, I guess it's just removable for washing or how yeah. does, okay. Yeah. Yeah, you have to kind of design things based on the hardware and the electronics that's available. Uh, there is a industry that's developing more wearable electronics. is still being developed. It's not quite mature there. There are companies that are making flexible electronics and washable electronics, flexible washable batteries. Uh, there is a, a quite nice industry that's working on this, but they're not still not quite ready for the complete integration with fabrics. So this, I, I think, is a very interesting research area. How do you decide whether to manufacture these yourself or just put them up online for other people to make? I actually make all of them open source. Uh, a lot of these that you see that are already ready to wear, a couple years ago, they are just open source projects. Uh, I would first make them myself by hand, and then I would write tutorials to teach people how to make something similar. So on websites like Hexter.io, Hackerday.io, Instructables, you can find my projects. For anyone who's maker and interested in building something similar, they can find all the components that's needed, the construction instructions, and the code that you can download and even 3D models. Sometimes I use 3D printing for accessories and uh, designs so people can download them and make them themselves. Um, And then converting them into actual products is a whole set of work. And I am intrigued by the whole process, and I really like seeing things come to fruition, come, come to life as a product that maybe people other than makers want to have. And that can also inspire people uh, what's possible in the industry. Uh, So my designs are three collections, nature, science, and future. Nature are all the paintings of beautiful places I've been and got flowers and uh, fish, all these nice sceneries that I really love. So I would, uh, I go somewhere and I see them, I will paint them. Then I would turn them into designs. People can find uh, those. And then I have the science ones that are astronomy, 
science. I have a Schrodinger's cat earring. <laughs> um, so some of these uh, have electronics that people, people can buy, or they can find those uh, DIY instructions to build some themselves. And the future one are the ones that are really elaborately futuristic. So they are not, um, the manufacturers are not ready to make them because a lot of these are hand-sewn. I had to cut each piece by hand and then sew them together and solder the LEDs piece by piece and program them. So those are the ones that are really made for makers that they can look at the free tutorials. If they want to build something similar, they can, they can do that. So they are called future. I hope that in, in the future, the industry would, the manufacturers would look at those creative designs, then they can support creative designers to make them into products. I'm just, I would be blown away by either your quantum computing career or your fashion career. And it, it is just, it's Thank you. so much more that you're doing both. I'm just looking forward to quantum fashion. I don't know what that uh, means. Uh, yes, <laughs> it is possible. Uh, I do have one that, uh, I mentioned earlier that Schrodinger's yes. cat earring. <laughs> yeah, it's 3D designed. One side is a dead cat, a skeleton. The other side is a, oh, a live okay. cat. Oh, <laughs> okay. I didn't see that. I didn't see that. That's cool. Yeah. So it also, <laughs> I think the point here is <laughs> it's all made to order, like 3D printed yeah. accessories. It's so wonderful that like you don't have any inventory. You don't have any waste. You produce them when your customer orders it online. I think clothing has to go that way. Let's see. Uh, one more question. Do you have a book coming out? I have my comics, the quantum computing comics that I'm putting together like a little book. It's also a notebook so people can order it uh, from Amazon very, very soon. Uh, I should probably launch it on my website and also tell people about it through Hackaday. Then uh, people can order the book with all the comics. So every page has a little comic. They can learn something. On the other side is empty. They can write notes on. People should watch and stay tuned on the Hackaday Quantum Computing with Comics through Comics project. I would announce some exciting new releases. So, cool. Cool. Kitty, do you have any thoughts you'd like to leave us with? Thank you guys so much for inviting me to speak on your podcast. This is a very nice platform. It has been great talking with you. It's nice to meet you. Thank you so much. Our guest has been Dr. Kitty Young, Senior Program Manager at Microsoft Quantum Systems, producer of MS Learn Quantum Modules, creator of the comic series Quantum Computing Through Comics, soon to be a book, lecturer at Hackaday and Microsoft Reactor, founder and designer of sustainable and STEAM fashion brand Art by Physicist, and creative technologist and lead of the fashion hack at Microsoft. Kitty has created a 10% discount code for Embedded FM listeners, you can use Embedded FM on www.kittyyoung.com for any order over $50, one per customer. Thanks, Kitty. This was absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much. Thank you to Christopher for producing and co-hosting. Thank you to Helen and Sophie for recommending Kitty. And thank you for listening. You can always contact us at show at embedded.fm or hit the contact link on embedded.fm. Remember, if you heard something but you're not quite sure what it was, you can now get a transcript. And a quote to leave you with. This comes from the amorphous internet. Don't compare your inside to someone else's outside. Embedded is an independently produced radio show that focuses on the many aspects of engineering. It is a production of Logical Elegance, an embedded software consulting company in California. If there are advertisements in the show, we did not put them there and do not receive money from them. At this time, our sponsors are Logical Elegance and listeners like you. <laughs>